Hallelujah. Father, we bless your name. Because your children have come because of you, not because of anybody. Your love has drawn them to you. Lord, I want to say thank you. Your presence is here and you are covering this chapel, this sanctuary with your Holy Spirit. I bless you. And may your love breathe into lives, oh Lord God, I ask you. May hearts be open, may inner ears be open. May you speak clearly to people. Let them miss nothing because you are the God who understands how to communicate. I bless them and I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Beloved, I want to say thank you so much to St. Francis Chapel. Leadership number one, my son in the spirit, Onesmus, is very dear to me. I first met him in 97. Then he was a teacher in Kigezi High School. We met in Buera Nyanje. And our hearts locked. Younger, me, younger than me, but, you know, he's from Kigezi. I'm from Nebi. Nothing in common, except height, maybe. <laughs> but the, the time we met, I saw fire in this guy. I remember telling the congregation at that point, when he finished preaching, that this is a rising star in Western Uganda. And that prophecy is yet to come. And I bless God that this, from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, today, I have been standing behind him just to see what God is doing through him. Thank you for supporting him. Please love him and encourage him. Please pray for him and his dear family, his wife Florence and the children. I thank God for his colleagues. Diana was with me in uh, All Saints Cathedral. We worked together. And again, for me, the bold lady, loves God. It's good to connect again. I'm very happy. I am very happy, San Franciscan, because of the love you've shared with me. I've fallen in love with you. And that was why when the, when the chaplain asked me, do you think you can consider coming again? I did not hesitate. I really think the best is yet to come. I really believe that God has opened a gate not only the physical gate there which is transformed, but within this institution of the university that is so traditionally important in the whole of Africa, God is on the move. And God is going to use you to bring about his purposes in Makerere. First of all, I'm going back home to my wife. I haven't seen her since Thursday. I would love you to send greetings to her. I don't want to go lying and telling her, you know, those guys really love us and they love you. <laughs> they try to send you greetings, which you have not actually done. Can I go and greet her for you? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to walk in, in the light because I'm a product of revival. Next Sunday, I'll be preaching in San Antonio in, West, in Texas. And again, I don't want to go to America and say the Ugandan church especially St. Franciscans, really greeted you, is not true. Can I take your greetings? Yes. Now I have your mandate. I can walk like a Christian, preach like a leader who knows the Lord. Praise the Lord. It has been so good. This guy drove me so hard, even at my age. But I have been healthy and strong, and my upper tap is stable. I bless God for ministry among you. Multitudes of you are blessed. Many more will be blessed in this service. And so to God be the glory. That's the, that's the hymn I really love to sing because I should only give God and nobody else glory. Nobody else qualify to be lifted up except our God. Turn with me to Luke chapter 15. Let me read verse 11 up to 24. It's a parable. A parable is an ordinary story with spiritual significance and meaning. An ordinary story with spiritual significance and meaning. And this one here is very powerful. We are looking at it. Jesus continued now because he had two other parables before. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had set off for a distant country and there squandered or wasted his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country 
and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself to, to one of the citizens of the country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating. Now imagine that. But no one gave him anything. Not even the manual pig could he even eat. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I'm starving to death. It looks to me like he was eating the leftover of the pigs or something like that. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way, a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Celebration mood came into the family that was pessimistic and quiet. This moment, I don't know whether it was noon or it was in the evening, whichever time it was, celebration came. This is a wonderful story about a father. I look at this father and I want to give you the theme of what I want to preach. Everybody thinks this is a political son story. This is a lost son story. Let me show you something else which is different. This is about the extravagant love of the father. This is about the father who loves unreservedly. Limitless love and love which is shared generously. This is a father who would give and give and give until he cannot give anymore. The problem is not giving, the problem is receiving from our end. My own father is a product of a polygamous home. His father had six wives. And so uncles and aunties and nephews and nieces are all my part of the extended family. Then my father walked the way of his own father. He got two wives. Well, you think he's scaled down, but that is still a problem. My mama was such a beautiful woman. I actually didn't know what my father was looking for. He got another woman, and this woman and my mother never had peace in the family. I, never, I grew up never knowing peaceful home. Because when these women, be, they begin to, to quarrel, you only need my dad to be around. Because when my dad is around, he's a referee. When he says, shut up, they keep quiet. But only for a minute or two, they start again. Shut up, they keep quiet. But when my, my, my dad is not around, the quarrel is like the fighting of cocks. It never comes to an end. And when I was growing up, I told myself, when I grow up, I will not marry more than one wife. I was not even a believer, but I saw the struggle of a polygamous home. They're all fighting over one heart of one man. And there is no way you can manage. There was a guy I met somewhere in Kasese. We went to visit that home and he brought four wives. And he said to me, I was a bishop, he said, Bishop, these are my wives and I love them equally. <laughs> that was a broad light liar. I came from a polygamous home, I know what it is. I said, really true? He said, oh yes, wait and see. I went for another visit. He came straight to me and said, your grace, now I mean, you are now your grace. Two have died. Now I'm waiting for one to die so that I can marry in church. <laughs> the equal love is now being partitioned. And believe you me, when I went last to that place, the last that one had also died. He came rushing to me today, I'm going to be married in church. That one also died. If you love them, why can't you mourn them, my friend? That's a liar. Yeah. 
But anyway, my father, because he came from a big family, he only gave us a little bit of land. I inherited about one acre only. But you know, at the age of 18, I met another father. His name is Jehovah. I gave my life to him. Then he began to commandeer my life from a teacher to a, a pastor to an archdeacon to a bishop to the archbishop. When I was archdeacon, he catapulted me to a, an area in Nebi. And in Nebi, people gave me land to put a house. And those people, I don't know what really is posi uh, positively good with them. They kept on adding my land and adding my land and adding my land, 20,000, 20,000 and 30,000, maybe 50, maybe whatever, and it kept on adding. My friend, my home is sitting on 31 acres of land. <laughs> now, from my own biological father of one acre, my heavenly father has given me 31, has given me 31 acres because he is a generous giver. Our God is a generous giver. May you have the capacity to receive. The problem with him is not giving. The problem with him is we do not know how to receive. Why? Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. Many of us whose fists are like this, how can you receive like this? You're holding on to nothing, friends. The love of God is for the giving. And he gives it so much, you said, God so loved the world that he gave. Just one son and the only one. They were not 20, they were not 15. No, just one son. He gave it all. So that whoever believes in him should not die, but have everlasting life. God paid a price for us. Not in silver, not in gold, not in diamond. He paid a price by his own life. He gave his own life that I may live. He died so that I may live. Hallelujah. My Father, forgiving us your Son, sending him into the world to be given up for us. Knowing we would bruise him and smite him from the earth. Hallelujah, my father, in his death is my bath. Hallelujah, my father, in his life is my life. That is how expensive you are. And some of us don't quite know the value God attaches to us. The value God attaches to us has no VAT. It's already added a long time ago in Calvary. And nobody can actually buy you. Nobody can pay anything for you. So do not come below your status. Do not be cheap enough to be bought with a smartphone, with a 20 or 45 inch television or whatever what is a car, the latest model. You are more expensive. You know that. And today we are going to look at a love that is so extravagant. Four sides of this love I want you to know. Number one, according to this statement, this love gives generously. This love gives generously. The man gave his property to his two sons because one came bothering the father. Father, I want my things. Father, I want what belongs to me. Father, I want what belongs to me. So he called his two sons. He said, this is yours, and this is yours. He is under pressure. Culturally, it wasn't allowed. But because his heart is a giving heart, he decided he would give them. Then we are told, Jesus told us, and shortly after that, the younger guy collected all his money. Then he turned his back to home, and he faced an unknown destination, a very distant land. He even doesn't know the destination. I hope you know where you are going. I hope you know where you are going. Very far from home, very far from security, very far from parental love, very far from familiarity, a stranger in a strange land among, among a strange people. No wonder he got there, he began to waste. Now, by the way, why did he go? Because love will give freedom. Love is not possessive. Love will release. 
Daddy said you can go. I'm not happy, but you can go. Parents who hold their children to them regret afterwards. Your son is old enough, he wants to get married, you give the guy a dowry, let him go and get married. The girl wants to go and get married, <laughs> you let the girl go and get married, provided she gets a right partner, not any garbage. Children are born in order to grow, and when they grow, they go. And when they're going, let them go. He loves enough to let them lead this guy to be in, 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 free, in, in peace. And also is willing to forfeit his son. And is willing to forfeit the labor which the son was giving him in his farm. And now he's only remaining with one son because the younger one has packed and the younger one has gone. Very painful, but painfully releasing his son to go. Friends, the second thing about this love is that it is a love that waits patiently. It is a love that waits patiently. Love, in essence, is patient. My dear sisters, we have young men who are very handsome and very articulate and very intelligent. But in the world of men, 99% of them, when they are relating with girls, they are liars. I also lied. <laughs> I said beyond what I was meaning. I tried to persuade with tongues. God gave me this, the gift of speaking a long time ago. In the past, I used it wrongly. Today, now I use it properly. And I used my tongue to lie to girls with a, a colleague of mine in the days of letters, not WhatsApp and the rest of it. He, would, he told me, I told this girl, I wrote her a letter, I dipped my fingers in a cup of water, I sprinkled the water in the letter, and at the bottom I wrote, see how much I was weeping as I was writing this letter. <laughs> Poor girl, she opened the letter, she saw all this and then read at the bottom and there were tears of the boyfriend all over the paper. She was trembling with excitement. And... Liar. <laughs> Wait. Wait for the right time. When a mango fruit is ripe, you don't have to bother it. It will fall. When love is ripe, it will come. When the right time comes, things work in season, friends. When the right season comes, it will come. What is the hurry? Love, wait patiently. This guy waited as he saw his son go. This guy, dad, was waiting when he knew his son could be squandering the money. Why? Because he's among strangers. Nobody knows him. Nobody's going to advise him. The, the son was struggling now because he was in need. Everything is gone. There is a family, no food. Daddy is waiting for a hungry son out there. But it stepped from hunger and went to this very low-graded work. A Jewish boy looking after pigs. Friends, if you find the bishop here who was archbishop, operating manually the border border taxi things. I hope you would be the first person to sit on my border border. But in case you found me dropping that law now from the Archbishop from Namirembe to now a border border rider, honestly, you'll say, Lord, have mercy upon our, our, our leader. <laughs> this boy is not supposed to even be connected with pigs and be with pigs, let alone touch it. But his Jewish religion, it, this is unclean. But now the boy is looking after pigs and feeding pigs and nobody's even giving him the food. They're giving pigs. Now you guys, you understand the menu of pigs, don't you? They don't eat decent things, do they? They, don't, they have a very mighty appetite. They eat almost anything. Nobody was willing to give him anything. Now, even while he was among pigs, dad was waiting. Dad, in his deep heart and faith, believed one day my son will come back. I have a son, my youngest son. I'm a father of two. My youngest son left us 16 years ago. Student who passed through here. He decided he will be a reggae composer. 
He's a musician. I even taught him myself how to play the guitar. He came into the city. He got lost into the city. Things have been tough for him. I meet my son and I look at him. I look at his dress code. I look at how he appears. I still hug him because he is my son. We have waited 16 years. Last year he appeared. Because his, his girlfriend, a girl from Colorado, wanted to go and see the village because a friend from America came. So they went home for the first time. And he got to see home. And he could not believe this is a home he left 15 years ago, 16 years ago. It has changed. It is transformed. It is beautiful. It is wooded. He stayed within the compound four days without getting out. Then he wrote, he said, I'm coming. You know, he called rather not, he didn't write. He said, no, he sent a text message. I'm coming for Easter. He appeared, spent a week. And this, this month of September, he came home again. And he stayed for two weeks. Now wants somewhere to build. Now wants somewhere to rear gods. You know, this is what we call gradual conversion. Yeah. <laughs> While... Mama and I are saying, hallelujah, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then he said to his, his cousin, he said, I did not know I was suffocating in Kampala. Home is so fresh and so beautiful and so therapeutic. November, I'm packing and coming back home. <laughs> True love waits. We are waiting because the young man can make a decision. Father is waiting because the young man can make a decision. The previous parables is about a woman who lost a coin, and that coin is one of the door for her, and she has to wear it on her forehead all the time. You can't lose it. If you lose, it's like losing your virginity. So it's a very serious business. She had to light a lamp. She had to strip to look for that coin and get the coin and invite neighbors to come. Now, sometimes you're wondering, if you're a Ugandan, for over only a coin, you have to invite your neighbors to come. No, this is not just ordinary coin. This is a dowry. Very important. But also a shepherd. One of the animals got lost. 99 remained. He locked them up. He's following one animal. When he finds it, he puts them on his shoulder, he's coming home. And then he calls his neighbor, I'm successful, I'm now okay. But why didn't the father follow the son? Why didn't the father send some kind of such party for the son? Why didn't he go? Because love was waiting. Love was waiting. Thirdly, this love forgives. And when he forgives, he forgets. That's a beautiful one. This love forgives. The boy came to a corner where it was tied. Things were hard. Food was nowhere to be seen. Friends have disappeared. His health is poor. His stomach is empty every day. His clothing now is sold. He's walking almost half naked. No shoes on his feet. He came to his senses. Beloved, this day, some of you will come back to your senses and realize you are not where you are supposed to be. The life you are leading is not the one you are supposed to be. You will realize royal blood actually is in your veins because of Christ. He died for you. He made you a lot more than what you believe you are. You will realize that God has a purpose for your life and a plan for your life. You will understand that God has something for you. And this, this boy, when he came to his senses, you know what he did? He remembered home. He remembered his father. And he said, how many of my father's hired servants eat and they leave? And here I am dying with hunger. He remembered home. He remembered father. There is that memory that never got lost. There is that original connection with family and father that never got lost. Even today, the Holy Spirit will activate in your spirit that you need the father, that you need his loving kindness and embrace, that you need his support, that you need his leadership. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He'll trigger it in you there. And so the boy says, then I want to, I then want to go and talk to my dad. I will tell him, daddy, I have sinned against heaven and, and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. My behavior has disqualified me. 
My state of, of, of art here, the way I look, has disqualified me. I don't look like your son. I don't smell like your son. I have degraded myself. And I can tell you, sin degrades, sin dehumanizes. Sin takes away the dignity I should have. One day I, come, I was coming home having drunk. I got alcohol into my system. I was coming home. Then I came to my auntie who gave me a chicken. I was having a cousin with me. We were walking. Now as we were walking in this open place, the chicken to me looked like a football. I kicked this chicken up, and my cousin saw it coming down. She, he also kicked it up. We kicked that chicken until we killed it. <laughs> Alcohol made us think the chicken was a football. And that is how low you can drop. What you see happening in the streets of Kampala as a result of sin is degradation of the dignity of humanity. You are not that person. Surely there is something better for you. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just move me to be a hired servant. I'm okay. I'll get food. I'll get a bed. I'll get a place. It will be dry. I'll be fine. I'll come again back under your security. Listen, if you have made a decision, better act on it. You can sit there under conviction from Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, when I reinforce the team. Up to today, you are under conviction. Do something wiser. Act on your decision. The boy got up. The boy began to make his way back home. The boy had a U-turn in his life. He had turned his back to his father. Now he's turning around and he's facing his father. I want to ask God to help us to face him. To come back to him. We belong to him. We are created trinitarianly, by the way. We know God has God the Father, God the Son, has God the Holy Spirit. You also know yourself has the body, the soul, and the spirit. If you physically want to prove it, look at your finger, this index finger here. Into how many parts is it divided? If it's a normal finger, it should be three. It should be three. A physical structure of a human being. One part is here, the second part is here, the third part is there. Trinitarianism is all over the place. And I believe very strongly creativity God puts in us is to do with our original nature. Original nature. You are made in the image of God. Now let me tell you something where we got it wrong through Eve. The devil told Eve, with you, if you eat this fruit, you will be as wise as God. You will be like God. Knowing good and evil, I don't know why he forgot the original blessing God gave them. Because God says, let's make man in our image. So in the image of God, he made them male and female. The original was male and female in the image of God. How can you be like God when you are already like God? How can you listen to a lie? If you are the son of your father, resemblance will tell the story. If you are the daughter of your mother, resemblance will tell the, to tell the story. We belong to God. This boy made a U-turn and he began to come home. Let me tell you, the journey home was very slow. The journey home was very slow. When the boy was leaving home, he went in a supersonic speed. Loaded. He could not leave home quick enough. But now coming home with nothing to offer. Nothing to show for. Nothing that you are put on. Not even on your feet. The guy was slowly but going home. I have this fierce imagination in my mind. That if he was with pigs, certainly there are already jiggers on his feet as well. Without shoes, walking is hard, but he is limping home. You limp home. Limp home no matter how. It's not about speed, it's about, about direction. Slowly make your way home. He's going home. Why? Home, Father's love is waiting. This is a love that forgives. And I will tell you the fourth thing. It is a love that restores. The love that restores. When the father saw his son from a distance, he recognized. He recognized his boy. He didn't look it in terms of physical structure. I'm sure his malnourished is thin. 
and he's in rags. That's not how he left. He doesn't look nice because he's walking, maybe limping, but the father saw his son from a distance. God, wherever you are, will see you for who you are. You cannot be hidden by anybody, not even by kidnappers here. God sees where no eye can see. He saw his son. He got up, the Bible tells us here. And among the Orientals, a dad of his caliber with, with, with servants cannot get up. No, he cannot. To meet a wayward son? No, he can't. But he got up. He ran. I don't know how old he was, but I think he was about 70 and strong like me. He got up and ran. Our father, when he sees you make one step, he gets up and runs. He came to seek and to save. Imagine, my dear beloved, the distance from heaven to earth, mathematicians tell us. Can we calculate? Very, very wide. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my body and soul found liberty at Calvary. He took a trip you could not take. He took a trip and landed in the womb of a virgin girl who did not know about pregnancy. For nine months he was in that girl, very inexperienced. When he was born, he was born in a manger, a king in a manger. A king in a manger, without a cover, without a midwife. Then he grew up in Nazareth like a peasant boy. Then when his day came to be baptized, he went to John the Baptist in River Jordan. He baptized him. My friend, there was a time he was coming like a king to Jerusalem on that day when the palm leaves are shaken. My friend, he borrowed transport. How can a king borrow transport? Do you think the Kabaka or Boganda can borrow transport? But the king of the universe borrowed transport. And then he entered in their friends. When they killed him, they killed him as a thief, a robber, and a murderer. Between two thieves and naked, by the way. The Bible tells us women stood far away because the victims of the cross were crucified naked. The Lord was crucified naked for you and for me. He's paying a price I cannot pay, you cannot pay. Then when it was time to bury, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. And the king of the universe, the creator of the universe, yes. Why? Paul summarizes it for you. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, he became poor for your sake. So that you may be rich out of his poverty. The creator of heaven became rich so that I, Henry Lukorombi, you, dear sister, you, dear brother, can become rich. And technically and seriously, we are. We are. Our inheritance is there. He came and paid that price. This father is restoring his son. He hugged his son. The son began to speak, Father, I have sinned again in heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Stop there. Don't go on. Quick servants, dress him up. Put a robe on, not this cheap one here, but put a robe on him, very expensive one. Put a ring on his finger. Now, this is a ring of sonship restoration. Put sandals on his feet because he's a son, not a servant. And then kill that animal. Now you wonder, Daddy, why can't you allow this guy to go and shower? This guy is smelling, this guy has been walking, this guy is sweating, this guy is not. No, it's not about washing, it is about restoration. Fast. Then there'll be too much water for him to wash in. I want him to look like my son. I want him to come home and take up. You know what really beats men's understanding is having offended you, Dad, this boy here. Having offended you, he comes home and you give him a VIP welcome. Now, you must be in a problem, daddy. 
For me, I stole some money from my, my father one time. I went to school, I bought food, I was surrounded like a king. Kids came around me, we ate. There was joy in school until time for going home. <laughs> I knew I would meet my father. I came home to heavy strokes, my friend. I was caned. Now, Dad, this boy wasted everything. Remember, lady, in John chapter 8 and verse 1 to 11, a woman was caught in the very act of adultery. They dragged her very early morning into the temple courts and began to accuse her. Teacher, we caught this one in the very act of adultery. Moses said we should stone such a people. What do you say? He stooped down, he began to write. Yes, we caught her. Yes, we caught her. But honestly, honestly, adultery is a two people thing, not just. Where is the man? Was the man a Pharisee? How would he escape? Is it because a woman is a victim and she's weak and she can be trapped? Where is the man? Where is the man? Where is the man? And they were looking at it and, and then they knew they broke the law. The law for punishment against adultery is for both. And now they have broken that law. They brought only one person. From the most important guy to the least important, they walked away one by one. And then Jesus looked around and said, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? He said, no one. Lord, listen to him. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He never will condemn. People will judge you. He will never judge you. People will call you names. He will never. People will turn their backs to you. He will turn his face to you. People will insult you. He will never. He never will condemn Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. You will not stand in condemnation because he has taken away your guilt, your sin, your offense against God. On himself, there is restoration going on here. Bring the best animal. In the Jewish family, an animal is always prepared for a VIP who comes home. This tattered looking boy, ugly looking boy, dirty looking boy is promoted to a VIP. The animal is going to die for him. God, I thank you. You are such a wonderful God. Beloved, he was dressed. There was celebration in the home. There was joy all over the place. God, I want to say thank you. I believe today God wants to do a miracle in your life. I also believe today God wants to bless you as a person. And the blessing of relationship restored is the mightiest blessing. You are connected to the superpower. You are connected to the one who owns heaven and earth. You are connected to the king of kings and the lord of lords and the ruler of the universe. You are connected with the God who was and is and is to come. What a powerful connection. Softly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Why should you tarry when Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me? Come home, come home, you that are weary, come home, softly, tenderly. Jesus is calling, calling, oh sinner, come home. He has booked your two-way ticket for home. Stand up, let me pray for you. Father, I want to bless your name. You are the God of eternity who knows us. Your knowledge of us is not just knowledge as facts. 
Your knowledge of us is reclaiming the relationship you had with Adam and Eve. Restoring us back to our original status. Calling us son and daughters. Calling us my own children and the spirit in us. It's not a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but the spirit of sonship, the spirit of adoption. Then we can call, call, call God Father and Abba. This day, the Lord wants to restore you, to build up a relationship again with you, that you come home to the security of a father who has been waiting for you. That the things which have bothered, bothered you, the things which have broken your heart, Many of the things which have confused you and torn you apart, whether from your parents or not, the things which have caused a lot of conflict in your life, he is going to sort them out and he is going to demolish everything that has locked you in because you are born to be free. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Come home to him who loves you. Come home to him whose message has come to you. Come home to him who longs for you day in and day out and waits. May he bless you today. May your life find peace today. May you understand joy, which is not human joy. May you begin to know the freedom because of the things that bound you for so long. He will break the chain from you. The one who loves you knows you by name and he has seen your experiences right from birth. Because he was there when you were being conceived. And up to today, he cares. He has waited long enough. Will you care to come home? Chaplain, come. Come call your people back to the Lord. Our God is here and our God is blessing multitudes today. With, with our eyes closed, and our heads bow down in adoration of the Lord our God, our Father, who has lavished his love upon us, who loves us extravagantly, and whose arms are stretched and wide open to embrace his sons and daughters, those who are coming back home, and those who have made a decision. Remember that prodigal son made a decision. When he came back to his senses and realized that his father loved him more than what was around him. In his waywardness, he made a decision to come home. And so the decision you make this afternoon is going to determine your destiny. And this is a precious moment. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. And an opportunity of a lifetime must be seized within the lifetime of that opportunity. I also appeal to you in the name of Jesus not to let go of this opportunity. Just come home and you're going to demonstrate that by raising your hand, first of all. You're saying today, I am coming home. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Do not look around. This is between you and God. This is between you and God. Raise your hand straight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You were probably born again. You backslid. You have, you have realized that you are living in waywardness. You're saying, Lord, today I am coming home. Praise the Lord for those many hands in the gallery, uh, down in the main sanctuary. Wherever you are, just raise your hand to the Lord. Do not hesitate. Do not hesitate. This, the way God has spoken, God wants you to respond to this message. And we're going to sing, and I will request those whose hands are up, just walk here. Just walk here. We'll pray for you. 
The bishop will also bless you. Just walk here. This message is leaving no stone unturned. Just come. The decision you make today will determine your destiny. Thank you, Jesus. Come home. Come home. The Father is here with his arms wide open. Thank you, Jesus. Keep coming from the gallery. Bring your property. Just come in the name of Jesus. Hearken to the voice of the Lord. Do not let go of this opportune moment. It will never return. It will never return. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Keep coming, keep coming. Keep coming. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We are here waiting. The Father is waiting with his arms wide open. Follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. I have this. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Keep coming. Keep coming. This is your moment. This is your day. This is your day. You'll never forget this season. Never, never, never forget this season. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We are here waiting. Come, keep coming, keep coming. Make a decision. It's between you and God. No turning back. No turning back. The cross before me. The wall behind me. No turning back. No turning back. Thank you, brother. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. The Lord is here waiting. The Father is waiting. No turning back, the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. You, you know, we... Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord again. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Lift your hands. Lift your hands to the Lord. Lift your hands to the Lord. As a sign of surrender. You're saying, Father, I have returned. I have come home. Repeat this prayer after me and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for your ministry to me. In the power of your spirit, you've spoken to me. I have realized my waywardness. And today, as an act of my will, I have made a decision. I have made a choice to come home. Receive me, Lord Jesus. Wash away my sin, my waywardness. The dirt that is visible, the dirt that is invisible, purify me. Come in, Lord Jesus, and dine with me, that I may dine with you. Write my name today in the book of life. S Spirit of God, fill me from the crown of my head. To the soles of my feet, transform me in this journey of sanctification. 
help me to walk in step with you, Holy Spirit of God. Today I declare that I am born again. I'm a child of God. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for lavishing your love on me. Your love is unconditional. Your love is sacrificial. It is an in spite of love. Receive me just as I am. Thank you, Lord, for restoration. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. We'll do, we'll, we'll do two things very quickly before Papa pronounces a benediction upon all of us. We'll do things. Just stay where you are. Two things very quickly. The rest may be seated for now. Number one is to request uh, Susan Morris, who came all the way from uh, Houston, Texas, uh, to greet the congregation, to just bring greetings. She came actually partly to be part of MacFest. And uh, the Lord is going to give her time this week. Uh, she'll be meeting several groups of people. Just come and say and, and bring greetings, please, uh, Susan Morris. I bring you greetings from Houston, Texas. It's a little bit warmer and more humid there, if you can believe it. But can I say that I met the two of you in 2005. We had come in, landed in Entebbe about 9.30 in the morning, went to Namarimbi, and were required to meet you at 2 o'clock. I want you to know that nobody would minister to his people until he could meet them and approve of them. And that touched me so much that he has that kind of father's heart. I just, I thank you for that. Bless you. Mm, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen and amen. Thank you, Susan. Uh, and, and finally, I want to invite the people's warden. This servant of God has ministered since Thursday, and uh, the people's warden is good at releasing blessings upon the servants of God. So we are going to stand with him and uh, agree with the people's warden as we pray for you. Papa, that the Lord will refresh you with his anointing. And, uh, and use you greatly in the U.S. Church, let's stand up together. Heavenly Father, just like we have learned this morning, your throne of mercy and grace is welcoming us each time and each moment of our daily lives. But when we need help, we can come to you boldly with confidence. You have deposited a seed of resurrecting our confidence to come before you. Not as a prodigal son, but as a blessed son. But we want, Lord, to thank you because you put that seed of message in our dear father and brother, the Bishop Orombi for whom this nation can confess and witness that we have a walk and we have a talk and have a life that stands and is a witness and approved by heaven that it is by grace, not by might, not by power, that we can minister and we can usher in your presence, especially at a time like this, when we need to hear your word and need to hear from you. We therefore want to thank you for this week that has been a blessing and for our brother who has put his time and life and has sacrificed, Lord, so much that your gospel be preached in this country. For to see unity from the different parts of our country come and congregate here in this chapel is a miracle and it is a sign that you are a God of wonders beyond our galaxy.
We therefore stretch our hands to our dear bishop. In the name of Jesus, and we ask the cloud of witnesses in heaven, the angels and the seraphims and everything that is before your throne, knowing that you are going to agree to our blessing on his life. We bless him with the goodness of the Lord and the mercies that are new every morning. We speak a life that is marked by your touch. We speak health. We speak wealth. We speak success and expansion of every territory for himself and family. That Lord God, as he walks this country preaching the good news, there will be a mark on his life that this is my son and I am well pleased with him. We speak the blessing of your protection, Lord God, over his life. That, Lord Father, that you whose wings can encompass all of us, shall, Lord God, encompass him, encompass his family, shall provide on his table, shall expand, Lord, in the joy that comes from knowing you, that his home shall be full of laughter, his home shall be full of peace, his home shall be full of provision. Not a day from now will he lack, but he will wake up each day knowing that your hand has provided. We want to pray that, Lord Jesus Christ, that you will make for him a way where there seems to be no way. We want to pray in the name of Jesus that God, you who is a God of this universe, shall bring heaven down into his life. Bring people, bring grace, bring every matter that is a matter to him, that it shall no longer be a constraint, but a gateway to more blessing and to more prosperity in everything he does. We ask that you return to him the energy that he has dissipated this week. Restore him, God, your God of restoration. We pray that, Lord Father, that you will give him even the ability to see the bigger horizon of what ministry needs are in this country. That his eyes shall see and his heart shall feel. And that, God, you will bless him abundantly with every supplication and prayer that he has made to you. It will be answered. Thank you for his son that is back home. We speak to that son in the name of Jesus, that he will walk the paths of righteousness. He will see your goodness in the land of the living. He will see blessing in his life. You will bring every desire that he has, Lord God, and that he will see you expand his territory. And this shall be a joy to our brother and his family. Lord God, as he goes from here, we pray that, Lord, that we will look up to the hills and we who know where our help comes from, that mercies and goodness shall follow him all the days of his life, and he shall forever know that in your presence there is the goodness of the Lord, and his mouth shall continually proclaim your goodness, and Lord, every aspect of his journeys from now on, we are just reinforcing the protection and the blessing of God on his life. Thank you, God, for the message in his heart. May that seed grow, and may he grow in every way, both in stature and in wisdom. For we pray this, we pronounce this, we establish this. In the mighty name of Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. children bless their father. The blessings are multiple. Bow your heads. And now may the blessing of God Almighty. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest upon you all, my beloved. Now and forever, my in the church say, Amen. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord.